All right, hello everyone. Uh, Isaiah Henkel here with Cheeky Scientist along with Naomi Noble. Hi, Naomi. Hey, Isaiah. <laughs> so, uh, so Naomi is with us. She's in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, and we do appreciate having her on. I know it's a bit later over there. Uh, Naomi is currently a research scientist at Evitera. Um, and this is your second position in industry, is that right? That's right. And, and the first is with the MapEye group, right? Um, so Naomi is a, a cheeky scientist associate. She transitioned to, into her first role. Uh, and things move a little bit faster in industry, so she's already into her second role now uh, and, and enjoying it. Uh, we brought Naomi on to kind of answer a few questions uh, related to her experience in the association, how it helped her, and then we wanted to talk about um, specifically, you know, how your PhD background affects getting a job, getting hired in an industry. So maybe, you know, maybe we can just start with kind of a general, you know, your experience as an associate. How, how did the pro, you know, if you're, imagine you're talking to somebody who's curious about joining the program, they have a, you know, a unique PhD specialty like we all do. How, you know, and they say, how is this program going to help me? What is this program? Sure. What you say? Oh, I mean, as a as an alumni, it's the, the Cheeky Scientist Association was essential for me, just in, in terms of learning the skills I needed to learn to get my resume recognized, to finally start getting some interviews with industry positions, and actually make the transition that was for me the best fit for my career. And you know, I came. So I come from the social sciences. I have a PhD in psychology, and I. Um, have a, a you know my first career I was a marriage and family therapist actually so I have this very soft social science background and I had a PhD in counseling psychology with a specialization in neuropsychology so I was like well I don't fit in here <laughs> right yeah. this is a group of PhDs in chemistry and biology and I was like gosh you know I, what what's here for me and what I found is that the skills that we're talking about in this group networking, you know, taking some career risks and putting yourself out there, um, how to negotiate, things like that. It's that's not unique to any discipline. And and those skills transfer across any of our niche areas. Um, For the PhD. So yeah, those are those are a number of the things I took away. Yeah. So so you you came in as an associate and, and that's really why we brought you on is because you have a um, you know, your specialty, you have a, a unique niche like we all do as PhDs, right? We, and you can go further and further down into that niche. Like you said, it was psychology. Like first you said social sciences and then you said, okay, psychology. And then you said, okay, you know, what was it? Counseling and... Uh actually pediatric neuropsychology if you want to get really specific <laughs> yeah. about it. <laughs> so yeah, pedi you know, pediatric neuro counseling or psychology, right? Yeah. So we go down in this hole, this down this rabbit hole, and a lot of us think because we're used to thinking in academic terms. Okay, I need to find a job title, that or a job posting that specifically asks for somebody with experience in pediatric neuropsychology. Sure. And you're not going to find that. And we and we we get that a lot. We say, well, my degree is in optical chemistry or in chemical uh, chemi computational chemical engineering is one that I got before. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to find somebody like asking for that job title or even asking for that specific experience in industry. Well, that's true. And I would add to that, um, if you have loved the things that you have done in your training, everything counts and everything matters and you can bring it forward into your industry career. I mean, in my current role, I draw on my neuropsychology background. I draw on my counseling background. I draw on all the stats I learned and my dissertation even. And so all of it matters. Uh, all of my clinical experiences mattered. So all the things that make us unique scientists, or if you don't see yourself as a scientist, at least someone with a PhD, every aspect of your training that you're passionate about, you can find a thread uh, with that to take into your new career. But you're right there's never going to be a job title that's going to capture it. And so you have to think outside the box. No, and that's an important distinction. And I think that's where a lot of PhDs get caught up when they're thinking about industry careers. At first, they're like, okay, I have the specific background. There's no jobs out there for this background. Maybe they find one ever and they think, okay, there's just no jobs. Um, and then at the same time, they think, well, I don't want to leave behind everything that I've learned, right? I have all these technical skills, all these transferable skills they have, even whether or not they know it. Um, and, they, and they think that they're leaving this behind if they take jobs that are outside of their realm. But like you said, it's really, it's, 
you know, a PhD, we always like to say it's a doctor, you're a doctor of learning, right? Like you can learn any of these technical skills, these transferable skills, you can take that thread, like you said, and go into nearly any industry career that's out there. It's just based on what you want to do, right? What is a good fit for you and for your career goals? That's exactly right. And, you know, I would, one thing that you often highlight in the association that I've really taken to heart is that, you know, we are really good at learning. And so apply those research skills and learn something new and add on to your skill set and then move forward with it. And that's what I had to do. You know, I took my, um, you know, all of the skills I gained in, in my doctoral program and in my career up to that point. And then I started reading online just different articles about career options, but then also it, it kind of drilling down into some of the science and some of the other peer reviewed journals in this new area. Um, and so I had to bring myself up to speed in a new topic area. Yes. It brought my old skills with, and I just sort of added this other layer and this other way of applying my skills. Um, but again, like it, all of us can do that. We're all really good at learning. Right. And so, I mean, the, I guess the overall takeaway is here, don't be held back by your PhD background or any kind of limiting belief that you have. Like you, you, you know, you're very valuable in industry. And I think a lot of PhDs come in feeling not so valuable yeah. and then they have to relearn that value. One thing we see also when, when people are considering joining the association or right when they come in, they're like, okay, where's everybody else at? That's just like me, right? They're like, I need to only connect with other people that are also pediatric neuro psychologists, right? That's the only people that can help me get a job. Um, but that is, they're actually in that, in, in one sense, those are the, maybe the least likely people to help you get a job or the least, maybe the toughest people, um, to get a referral from, right? Cause maybe they're going for some of the similar positions and, and you shouldn't ignore the 99% of the other PhDs out there or the other people in, in industry careers that can give you a referral to somebody else that's in that field, right? We, right. All, we often think about our direct connections, but we don't think about our secondary connections, which in many cases are, are even more valuable because it sets you up to kind of baby step to getting that big job referral. You have to get that referral to the referral. Like you ask for an introduction and then the person you're introduced to is much more likely to give you a referral because you had a shared connection. So it's just, it's one of those things that we don't think a lot about in academia. And um, so, I mean, what was your experience with that, with like getting to interact with all different kinds of PhDs from many different countries? I mean, did you find this kind of diversity helpful or limiting? Oh, it was so helpful. And I didn't appreciate or know it at the time, Isaiah, that the 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 exquisite diversity of Cheeky Scientist Association and it's just the international perspective that everybody else, you know, brings to bear on on everything that we discuss and you know, on the Facebook posts and everything else in the group. Um I didn't appreciate it at the time that that was setting me up for success in my career. I am regularly at the table with people from around the world um, who are multilingual and we're working across multiple time zones. And so all of these skills and this appreciation that I, you know, gained in our group it transferred into my career too. Um, you know, to your, to your point though about you know, pairing with people who are just like us in the group. I mean, I think it's a, it's nice. It's a nice to have, right? It's like it's nice to feel like you're not alone. And also, because we're all, you know, in our little rabbit hole of our research world, you probably are going to be the only one in the group with your unique area of expertise, and that's fine. Um, I would say that I I benefited just as much from following the successes of others. Um, who were, you know, interested in going into like some sort of consulting world that I never saw myself in. And, oh, by the way, like currently I'm a consultant <laughs> and I'm in that role. And so it was really helpful to have that window uh, into their into their interview process, into their negotiation process, the, the kinds of interview questions that we're all getting. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily so unique to that particular role and it helps us all prepare. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It couldn't be better said. I mean, and, and I think yours is a great example because at, at the very beginning, you said I'm in the social sciences. It's a bit softer. But, you know, the National Science Foundation just put out like their full list of everything they considered STEM and social sciences is considered STEM. And a lot of people don't know this. They think, OK, you know, they hear the word scientist. And if they're an engineer, they're like, well, that's not for me. 
but STEM has the word engineer and mathematician, but it doesn't have the word social scientist. So people think, well, that's not for me, right? So if you're hearing words that make you think it's not for you, dig a little bit deeper because it actually is. Because what connects us all, all outside of maybe a, f a few fields of the humanities, is the use of the scientific method, right? So if you're using the scientific method, that's really what is classified now as STEM overall. And I think that's what unites us more than anything. Like you said, you're not going to find somebody maybe with your specific discipline outside of you know the five members of your committee. But when it comes to getting a job at the level of PhD careers, high level careers, you know the the information, it, those patterns uh, apply to everyone, no matter what your PhD background is. Yes. Uh, the the last thing I would add to that is. It was another, you may recall, Isaiah, that it was another cheeky scientist who gave me the lead for the interview that ended up being my first job in industry. Mm. And uh, you're, you're right, to the point that people who have similar backgrounds to us in the association are probably vying for some of the same jobs. Um, but, you know, we can also help each other out and it's, it's important to keep an eye out for stuff like that. So anyway. No, that's a good point. And I think that's good to kind of close on. If you're, you know, as PhDs, we can get pretty competitive. Maybe sometimes even in our academic environment, we've been pitted against each other, but you can't be in a collaborative environment because even with, you know, over 4,000 members now in the association, the odds of uh, the some, you know, somebody being ready for the same job at the same time and that career and position being the right fit and having, you know, all of that line up together, we we've actually have not seen that and, and there's so many jobs out there that you don't realize we think that it's only because of the only the jobs that are posted for our field are the only ones available but there are so many jobs for phds i mean they're, they're certainly in demand in industry and and yeah. i guess the takeaway is don't be held back by your by your background or any other Absolutely. Limited place. yeah you know in industry one of the things i love about my career right now is that our experience matters as much or sometimes more than the degree and so I am working with people who are far more senior than I am, who don't have a PhD, uh, but they have, you know, 10 or 15 years in the field that I don't have. But uh, PhDs are so valuable. And, you know, the depth of training that we have and the depth of knowledge that we have, whether or not people are aware of it right this second, you know, when you have to apply it in the workplace, suddenly, at least for me, really appreciated the depth of, and, and the carefulness of the training that I received. Um, and having a PhD really does have a lot of value. Em employers see it um, mm. and employers value it too. Anyway, just to add that. Perfect. No, that's, I think that's perfect and a great message. So as we always say, remember your value as a PhD. Uh, thank you, Naomi, very much for taking the time to, to talk with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, for all of you on live, thank you. Good to see you too. And uh, we look forward to watching your continued success, Naomi. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Isaiah. Good to see you. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.